Okay, so we'll continue with our next two talks, which uh, you could summarize as there's also a thing as too much information, because once you have too much information, you can get tensions. And we're starting to see this in cosmology. And Tamara, uh, Charlie, on uh, Wednesday, I don't think Tamara needs any further introduction, so I'm not going to waste your time on that and give the floor to Mara, who will talk about cosmological tensions. Thanks very much. Cool. I want to, yeah, I, I once did a, I've done some television talks where the amount of like microphones and stuff on your back is absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, thank you very much for the organizers um, for inviting me here. It's always a delight to come along to this conference. Um, I th find it is full of lots of interesting ideas and like people really trying to think fundamentally about the universe and how it works and what the um, laws of physics are. Uh, and as, you know, a bunch of associated questions about how we can use information in our, in our lives. So here I'm going to talk about cosmological tensions. I'm going to make a, do a rash thing and attempt to make this hide. Nope, didn't work, doesn't matter. Um, cool. Uh, so what are the tensions um, that we are talking about? Um, so firstly, we have the... Um, the uh, cosmological model there. Oh, first I was going to say, um, I am a bit like Charlie. If, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to um, yell them out and ask them. I actually can't see anyone right now, so I won't be able to see your hands. So just yell at me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to get derailed and sort of talk about things a bit more rather than doing my whole presentation. Um, okay, so we have this cosmological model, which works amazingly well. We have a massive variety of different um, uh, measurements. Um, and as a combination of those, we now have the audacity to try to claim that we understand uh, some of the, the physics of the universe to better than 1% precision. We've measured these cosmological parameters extremely well. Um, note within our particular cosmological model. But some tensions have started to emerge. So we've heard a little bit about this, so I'm going to go rather quickly. But the first one is the H0 tension. So H0 is the current rate of the expansion of the universe. We have uh, the hubble lemaitre law. Velocity is proportional to distance. The Hubble parameter is the um, proportionality factor. In general, it's the rate of change of scale factor divided by the scale factor. Um, but if we put the present day values in, then the scale factor today we usually define as one. So that's the current expansion rate um, is H0. Now, this is a, a plot from the recent Resedal paper, which shows the likelihoods that we have for the, um, for the supernovae here in green and for the cosmic microwave background from Planck here in blue. And this is designed to demonstrate that they seem to be um, somewhat discrepant. So that's the first of the tensions. I'm not gonna talk about those. Just move this out of the way a bit. How's that? Cool. Um, the other one that's come up is the S8 tension, and I'll explain a little bit what, what that is. So when we're measuring things about the universe, one of the things that we measure is how clustered it is. And we use the term sigma 8 to do that. Now, what is sigma 8? Basically, it's if you take a sphere of eight megaparsecs, you plonk it down in the universe over here and you measure the density. Then you plonk that same sphere over here and you measure the density over here. You repeat that many, many times. The dispersion in that measurement is sigma 8. Now, a question I always get when I explain that to people who are not familiar with it, why 8 megaparsecs? Well, when people were first defining this constant, that was the, um, that was the value where the answer was about 1 in normalized density units. So that was just a, um, a peculiarity. Yes, so it's the density. So it's the um, density over density or under density. So the mean density of the universe, uh, sorry, just get a drink of water. It's the, oops, it's, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm not sure what's going on. <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, so it is the, ooh, something weird's happened. Um, so it is the, um, when we talk about the thing that, that's one is the, you have the density measured at a particular place, 
minus the mean density of the universe divided by the mean density of the universe. So it's the over density at that particular position. Thanks for asking for the clarification. And the plots that you see in these sort of plane is you, you measure sigma eight and the matter density, you get some plots like this from things like uh, weak lensing and they, con they conflict somewhat, not as badly as the H naught measurements with the measurements <laughs> from Planck. So from the cosmic microwave background. Now you'll often sometimes hear another parameter called S8 as opposed to sigma eight. Uh, and that's, you'll see that there's this degeneracy direction along here. S8 is defined thusly, so that you basically sort of draw a straight line through here and you get flatter contours. It's just, it's just measure, um, measuring a combination of parameters sort of along this degeneracy direction. So you can um, make it a little bit more sort of matter density independent there. Cool. Um, so those are the tensions. Thank you. Um, and, you know, tensions are intriguing. So, for example, we have a previous tension, um, which was the one where we were not sure um, in the 1990s and earlier. Um, galaxy observers said that we had about 30% of the matter density in the universe required to make the universe flat. Meanwhile, theorists were like, if it's close to flat, it should be exactly flat. So we really should have a, a matter density of one, if or a total density of the universe of one. And there was this massive gulf between them of 70% of the universe being missing. And of course that was solved by adding a cosmological constant or dark energy, because what the theorists were actually saying um, was that the universe is flat. So if you have 70% of something else in the universe, you can make these two agree. Um, and that was um, what was done when uh, measurements, including supernova measurements, um, showed that the universe was accelerating. So, okay, so tensions like this are interesting. If, two, if measurements are disagreeing, maybe there's some other parameter of the universe that's very profound and important that we're missing. Um, now, for the H naught and S8 tensions, here's just a smattering of, of uh, solutions that were suggested in the literature in the last little while. Um, this was <laughs> literally just the results of a search I did on ADS um, for the last, since the beginning of the year. Uh, and this was just a selection, I've cut out some, but all sorts of different um, suggestions theoretically for what could explain this discrepancy. Um, in the past 18 months, since the beginning of 2021, this was just all of the things that had tension in the title, if you have refereed papers and astronomy. Um, so there's a lot of tension in astronomy, basically. We're a very tense bunch. Um, now, uh, when we're looking at cosmological tests and how we measure them, um, I classified them in two main ways. One, we have homogeneous tests and one, we have inhomogeneous tests. Um, and I'm just gonna summarize a, a couple of these really, really briefly um, and note that you have um, homogeneous tests, like the classic one of these are things like the, the supernova measurement, measuring the expansion rate of the universe and how that changes with time. Um, and inhomogeneous things are like clustering, like I was talking about and lensing, things where you need an inhomogeneous universe. Now, to measure homo the homogeneous expansion of the, the universe, like the, its homogeneous properties, you can use things like standard candles, which include supernovae, Cepheid variables, um, and um, gravitational waves. Uh, you can use things like standard rulers, which are things like the cosmic microwave background and baryon acoustic oscillations. And you'll notice that the, these measure the luminosity distance, so they're multiplied by one plus z. These measure angular diameter distance, so they're divided by one plus z. And this will become relevant later because I'm going to talk to you about potential redshift systematic errors. Um, because I noticed uh, quite a while back that, you know, if there's some tension and these two are different, maybe it's actually a tension in our redshifts, not um, our magnitudes or other measurements that's causing a discrepancy between some of these. But then there's also another um, type of measurement that's also a ruler, which is the time delay measurements of lensing around. Um, uh, where, you, where you have uh, lensing time delays. And that effectively also is divided by one plus Z. And I, was, I should have mentioned that the standard candles tend to have, well, the supernovae have high H naught. Um, the rulers tend to have low H naught, but this one has a high H naught and is a ruler. So that sort of breaks that nice pattern that I was looking at. Um, but anyway, the, limp, the homogeneous expansion of the universe stuff has a limit to how good it can be. And this, I keep putting this 
up from 2007, because this was a paper that I wrote where I realized that just doing supernova cosmology wasn't going to be enough. Uh, because this doesn't matter what these are, but they're a whole bunch of different non standard models, and you can't distinguish between them if the universe stays consistent with an overall expansion um, of that's related to the, um, the, the like that looks like our lambda CDM model of the universe. So we add a bunch of other types of measurements. We've got lensing, um, and that's really cool because it can um, detect differences or deviations from relativity if you compare lensing and clustering because they're, they're related to different parts of the metric. Um, you can measure growth of structure. Um, that also is something that distinguishes uh, models that have the same expansion history can have different growth of structure within that expansion. Uh, I've already mentioned the amplitude of density fluctuations. Oops, there's a few here. We can measure non-Gaussianity, so we can measure deviations from where if the clusters are more clustered than the voids. Uh, we can measure the motion of stuff through the universe, so peculiar velocities. Uh, and we can also do things like measure the red shifting of light as it goes in and out of voids, which is also different, uh, voids and clusters, which is also different uh, in different models of the universe. Um, one thing that comes up uh, quite frequently these days, but is a bit obscure if you're not in the know, if you've heard of a three by two point measurement. So I'm working with the Dark Energy Survey and one of the key results from the Dark Energy Survey is the three by two, three by two point measurement. And what that's doing is you're measure, combining lensing and clustering. So if you have here a cluster of galaxies or like clustering in the foreground and, and lensing in the background, not just an individual cluster, but in general, um, and you separate these out, you can do a two point correlation function. So you can basically measure the pattern in the distribution of galaxies. You can do a two point correlation between the galaxies and the lenses. Uh, and the shear sort of shape of the lenses, and you can do a two point correlation between the shear as well. And if you combine those and do those all simultaneously, that's what three by two point is. So that's, I thought I would just mention that because that's a bit obscure unless you know what you're, uh, what you're talking about. Um, and this is a measurement that was from the Dark Energy Survey, but with a lot of other ones there. So we've heard a bunch about kids, which a bunch of people here are involved in, and that's the, the blue one here. Um, and Planck is the green one here, and our DES one is sort of in the middle. Uh, and so our measurement is not really in tension with S8, once you take into account all the other parameters, but, the, um, but definitely still in tension with the um, Hubble constant measurement, which is this purple contour relative to the gray one there. <clears throat> so anyway, so we see some tensions. We've got all of these beautiful different array of measurements. And one of the problems is, um, with the theoretical models, which I know Nikki is going to talk about um, in, in the next thing. It's, uh, it's challenging to tweak a model in one way that fixes one observation without breaking the others. Um, and so it's natural to ask, could systematic errors be at play in our observations? So firstly, these are really complex analyses. There are a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of measurements that have to be made. And just as an like, example, if you look at the nuisance parameters in the cosmic microwave background fit, where you're subtracting foregrounds and dust and um, doing um, uh, Sunyaev's Eldovich effects uh, things, there's a lot of free parameters in that fit. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a really complex measurement, basically. There's also hints of internal tensions in the data. And while this is not necessarily something to worry about, uh, you can see that there's a tension in that when you fit the cosmic microwave background temperature power spectrum at low um, angular scales and at high angular, angular scales separately, you get this here where you see uh, the blue contour is the low scales, the red is the high scales, and the, the, the purple in the middle is the final result once you add um, polarization and, and stuff in there as well. Um, and so there is sort of internal tensions. It's not enough to write home about. It's, it can be perfectly okay. And there's param when you fit the, there's these together, the parameters can be different. But it is, you know, it doesn't, it's not like, all I'm saying is it's not perfectly smooth sailing um, through things. And I, I, I this is being un unfair. Uh, my next plot's going to be unfair to the Planck collaboration. But I was just, this is a, um, a plot that I've been using for a very long time in my um, third year uh, astrophysics lectures where you're fitting a, a model to your model's not good enough because you're fitting a straight line to what should be a parabola. And if you have your low and high redshift 
um, measurements, uh, you get these, you, you find quite different uh, results. And if you combine them, you get this nice little thing in the middle, um, which has way too tight error bars because there's some tensions internal in your, your data. Um, uh, and I'm not saying that the blank people are doing this, but in general, in cosmology, there can be effects like this happening where our error bars um, are too tight because there's a little bit of tension between different data sets. So that's something to keep into account. Um, another issue is, uh, or another factor is, as I was mentioning, there's a lot of different model extensions that you can do. And even if, for Planck, if you add, for example, cherry picking the one that gives the answer that gives a higher H naught, if you have a, um, add an equation of state of dark energy, the best fit Planck model is over here at a high Hubble constant. Um, so uh, you can, your, this is just pointing out that your Hubble constant value is actually quite model dependent, depending on which model you put in and, and fit. Now, I don't work with the CMB. I, I work mostly with supernova stuff. And I've spent a whole bunch of time in the last decade looking at ways that the supernova data could have done gone wrong. And I don't typically measure H naught with supernova data. I do the dark energy side of things. Um, but nevertheless, we want, we want to get this. And, and it, I became curious to see if there could be any problems with the supernova data. So here's a classic example of the supernova data. This is the distance modulus versus redshift. This is the dark energy survey data. Um, and you've got... Um, the, the data points here at low redshift, high redshift, and um, the distance modulus is basically how bright they are. Now, if you look through the supernova literature, basically all of the um, supernova literature is looking at trying to calibrate this magnitude. Uh, if, you're, if you have an uncertainty and you're trying to fix it, there's a huge amount of effort has gone into doing that calibration really, really well and really, really carefully. Um, but almost no attention was paid to the horizontal axis here. Uh, and so this was sparked my interest because of the difference between angular diameter distances and luminosity distances. And if you note that what, when we measure um, H naught with this, what we, what's it, it's actually sensitive to is the absolute um, overall magnitude calibration here. Um, it shifts up and down. Um, and you can see the, the steep part of the curve down here at low redshift, which is what we use to measure H naught, um, it's very sensitive to redshift. A small shift in redshift will actually put you quite a way off in the vertical direction. So just as a case study, um, I decided that I would have a, a bit, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this one particular um, source of potential systematic errors and some of the things that we've looked at um, to try and make sure that we're not being subjected to these. So firstly, how large a redshift error would matter? This is the, dis the difference in magnitude that you would get um, if you shifted the redshift in this previous plot. So this is just taking one of these and shifting it left and right as though I had mistakenly put a systematic error in my redshift. Um, and you can see that here is the horizontal lines are how much of a difference you would need to make H naught change. Uh, and these gray bands are limited by an error of 10 to the minus four in redshift at the bottom and 10 to the minus three here. So you can see to get like a H naught of 73 measurement. We do most, uh, most of the power in H naught there would come from the, the low redshift regime down here. Um, a 10 to the minus three red, um, redshift shift would do that fine. So we could completely get rid of our tensions if we had a 10 to the minus three shift in redshift. And we care if we have a 10 to the minus four shift because that's going to affect our results. And that's if the shift is systematic, not, a, um, not uh, what's it called, random. Uh, by the way, does anyone have any questions at this point? If not, so this is just another plot of the same thing. What size of systematic error in redshift would give you a, a shift in H naught? So yeah, as I said, about a 10 to the minus three would get rid of what, um, get rid of the tension. Is a 10 to the minus three shift plausible? That's what I'm about to talk about. So firstly, let's say, as I said, a 10 to the minus four shift would, um, would cause a systematic error that we care about given the size of our error bars at the moment. Um, and this is what uh, a 10 to the minus four redshift shift would look like. So I'm gonna, this is a um, spectrum that we took at the Anglo-Australian Telescope in Australia um, as part of the OSDES survey. And if you notice now, I'm flicking between two spectra. You can see the numbers up the top are changing and you may not be able to notice the change in the spectra. 
So that's a 10 to the minus four shift in redshift. You can sort of see it most on this bottom one down here that's shifting back and forth. So 10 to the minus four shift is tiny. It's much less than one pixel um, in our spectrograph. Um, you notice a couple of interesting things in this spectrum. I chose it specifically. Um, this has an unsubtracted skyline or cosmic ray over here, and it also has a wavelength calibration error in this here. This is unusual, but it does to happen not that rarely. Um, in, and I've also been looking at DESI spectra and stuff like that. This does happen, where one side of the spectrograph doesn't actually match the redshift of the other side of the spectrograph. There's some like differential um, ca calibration errors. And so you, if, if you make your, if you choose this as the line that you choose to line up to make your redshift, or you choose this, you'll get, or you choose H alpha, for example, then you end up with a shift that's a 10 to the minus uh, three, so two by 10 to the minus three in this particular case. Um, and so that's, that's a kind of calibration error that can happen in a spectrum. Yep. What, what, does, what, does, what peculiar velocity would that correspond to at that redshift? Let me skip forward to that. Um, I was just, I'll, I'll, brief, I'll get to that in one second. I'll just show you um, what this looks like in, um, in real data. So not in real data, this is simulated data that has a 10 to the minus three shift in redshift because I was like, you know, surely we would have noticed that in our data. And you can see there's a little bit of an uptick here um, but basically this 10 to the minus three systematic is because the, the scatter in the individual points is still quite large, even though they're great standard candles, you do get, um, it would be still a bit, little bit hard to distinguish um, in real data. And this is data, fake data with a 10 to the minus three shift. This is real data from um, supernova papers. And it would be hard to see these changes with, with the data here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll talk about the magnitude of possible redshift biases that we have. So I wrote a big paper on, on all of the different possible redshift biases that could come in. We have things like observational error, we have physical effects, and we have theoretical errors, which I'm like the, oh no, surely we didn't do that um, type of things. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully we're not in this state, uh, but there are actual theoretical errors that we've made. So looked at lots of different things. Have we done the error to vacuum conversion correctly? That's a 10 to the minus four error. Um, we, have we looked at, if you take not all of our spectra, nice straight flat lines, the absorption spectra have slopes in them. And if you take the centroid of a, a line while it's on a continuum that has a slope, your centroid is wrong. That can cause a 10 to the minus four-ish type of error quite easily or a few by 10 to the minus four. So if all of our galaxies that we measure, for example, luminous red galaxies have that slope, we've done that, then we can get um, a, a bit of a systematic um, physical effects. Um, we looked into whether you could have a, like the gravitational redshift. Um, so a gravitational redshift occurs as a light comes out or into gravitational wells. If the source is in a cluster of galaxies and we're observing it from a less dense region of the universe or you know vice versa then you would expect a gravitational redshift but it should only be on the order of a few by 10 to the minus five a bit less than 10 to the minus four even in the extreme cases so that one's probably too small to worry about uh, on the other hand physical effects like peculiar velocities and this was your question um, are on the order of 10 to the minus three so the earth about the sun is 10 to the minus four. We don't worry about that so much. The, um, also because we, we usually observe perpendicular to our motion because the dark side is on the uh, other side. So we, we, our telescopes are usually pointing away from the sun. Um, the motion of sun about the galaxy is on the order of 10 to the minus three. The galaxy with respect to um, the CMB is on the order of 10 to the minus three in the other direction, but slightly bigger and in com combination. Um, our total motion of our, of our sun with respect to the CMB is about um, 370 kilometers per second. So that's a 10 to the minus three redshift error. So I panicked for a little bit and thought, have we done the heliocentric correction incorrectly? Because we need to get our measure our redshifts in the cosmological frame. Uh, and uh, if we, um, so we need to take, subtract our motion with respect to the uh, CMB from all of our observations. And we do that, and that um, is something that obviously is systematic, although it would be positive in one direction of the sky and negative in the other. So if we have a full sky, even that should cancel out in, um, in aggregate. 
So um, when you, just uh, as a side, we also looked at the effect of peculiar velocity corrections on gravitational waves. So we, when, you, when we look at the, um, I might actually just skip to another um, plot that I have because I've got, oh, maybe I can't. Yep. The motion of distant galaxies. Exactly. So let me see if I can get the, I don't know where my, my thing's gone. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll skip forward and show, show you the nasty way instead of looking through the um, thing. But so we recently made a, a, measure, a, a measurement of this. So what you're looking at here is the white dots are the supernovae that go into the Hubble constant measurement. Um, over here, and so this is from Brout et al. It's on Astro PH. These, these, we actually made a slight mistake on the, these plots that's in the Astro PH version. So look at these ones, not the Astro PH one. We're updating it in, as soon as the referee um, uh, finishes. But here we've got, this is basically, you can see this is the CMB direction over here, and this is the, the antipode of that. And we've measured the magnitude of supernovae with respect to this, um, to, with respect to uh, across the sky. Um, and this is like just looking at the magnitude offsets. So if you have peculiar velocities that change your redshift, you're going to get an offset in the Hubble diagram. And that's basically you're measuring your peculiar velocity that way. Um, uh, it's, you can assume that the total offset is due to peculiar velocities only. So it, we, because uh, yeah, yeah, I'm getting to your bit, your bit. So this bottom one is showing the non-random part um, because this is uh, with before we have subtracted the CMB dipole. So we have uh, um, the brighter supernovae over here, the fainter supernovae over here, which is what you would expect if you have motion with respect to the CMB. So that's working well. We subtract the CMB dipole. And basically what happens when you subtract the CMB dipole is you actually overcorrect nearby galaxies because a whole, like a lot of the nearby galaxies, we're all moving with respect to the CMB in the same way because we're all attracted by the same, you know, great attractors and same mass densities in the universe. So if you subtract the CMB redshift from only our motion, it gives a false relative velocity with respect to nearby galaxies because they're also moving with us. So we shouldn't have subtracted the redshift with, when we're talking with respect to nearby galaxies. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes somewhat, somewhat sense. Um, so what you then do is you then, this next step is you model the motion of the galaxies nearby us. You do a, a peculiar velocity model. Typically that's done by measuring the density of galaxies, calculating how fast they should be moving given the densities that are around them and, um, and then uh, correcting those additional motions. So those are the peculiar velocities of the distant galaxies. And if that's done perfectly, that should leave no residuals. At the moment, it doesn't leave no residuals, but it does improve on this. And that's just because our, we know our peculiar velocity model isn't complete yet. We need much more data um, and much more complete data uh, over, the, uh, over the nearby universe in order to be able to do this better. Um, and we're working on that as well. Um, and the, but I should also note that this reconstruction is somewhat model dependent because it, uh, usually assumes a standard cosmological model. And if that, um, is, that model is incorrect, then these will also be, um, that could potentially cause a bias. Um, but luckily the model dependence is really small. Um, if you, any reasonable uh, like WCDM, Lambda CDM of the relatively standard models um, would uh, do negligible change in your cosmology um, in this particular aspect. And does that sort of answer your question? Sort of. Cool. So I'll go back because I was going to notice um, a. So if we're living in an underdense or overdense region, we're no longer talking about peculiar velocities, we're talking about Hubble velocities. We would map that into a peculiar velocity. So there, we, there's still a, 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 um, a overall expansion rate of the universe. And you can add to that a monopole term 
in the peculiar velocities as well if you want if there's like a small local over density or something like that or even a large one Um, yeah, so this, these, those peculiar velocity maps have different, they don't do it just in shells because we, um, because we know that there's a lot of uh, additional motion all over the place, but it's done in bins of uh, volume around uh, within um, a redshift of about point, um, I'm going to stuff this up, 0 0.06 at the moment. Um, uh, we, that's where we have the good data. Um, so that's what we have. Yeah, cool. Okay, so another five minutes or so. Thank you. Okay, so um, I was going to note that we put we published a paper here on um, H naught from gravitational waves. Um, you know that there's been a gravitational wave measurement of H naught, um, which is which the initial publication had a seventy plus or minus about ten kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, and just to note how important peculiar velocities actually are. Um, the I'll skip through this because I'm lacking time a little bit, uh, but the the peculiar velocity correction that get, got you this was about seven kilometers per second per megaparsec. So they did take into account peculiar velocities, and it's actually a very large at part of the the um, error. Well, there, there's um, uncertainties here, and it's quite a big part of one sigma um, there. So my um, postdoc, Colin Howlett, is uh, a whiz at peculiar velocities and make, making measurements. And he looked at the possibilities for um, doing that peculiar velocity measurement better. And it turns out that the peculiar velocities, the, the redshift or the peculiar velocities that were used were quite on the extreme ends of what they could have been. And going through very quickly, the summary being that um, if you measure with what we think is a sort of more comprehensive um, knowledge of our peculiar velocities at the, uh, as we have it at the moment, it lowers the, um, the Hubble constant a little bit uh, in these measurements. But the, remember the error bars are about 10 on this one. And I haven't explained this, but the error is about, about half that on this one. Um, and so there, there's still less than a sigma, but it's about a 0.3 sigma or a 0.9 sigma. This one has orientation information. So sorry for jumping through that quickly, but I was just showing you some Systematics. I'm going to rapid fire through a few other. One of the theoretical errors that I, I mentioned um, is uh, if you add velocity uh, redshifts like this, um, you the way that we define redshift is as this, and I'll flash through the derivation. In the actual true um, relationship between the observed redshift and your recession velocity redshift and your peculiar velocity redshift should be this. So if you use this as a low redshift approximation, you're missing a term that's the recession redshift times the peculiar redshift, which gives you a 10 to the minus. Um, if you do the heliocentric correction using the additive redshifts, you get a 10 to the minus three error at redshift of one. Now that's not important for H naught because we don't care about um, the, uh, the high redshift errors. And this is a very small error at low redshifts. Um, and so that this doesn't actually impact H naught. But it is very common. And if you've ever used the NASA Extratoriactic Database and calculated CMB redshifts from this, it has um, this error in it. And we're trying to work with them to uh, get them to fix that. And so Anthony Carr has been looking at, looking at this. So be cautious, do your own CMB corrections if you're using uh, redshifts from NED for high redshift objects. This was evident in the previous, so the Pantheon um, sample is, a, is the, the sort of um, gold standard uh, supernova sample to date. Um, the previous release of that had this error in it. And you can see that if you plot the uh, redshifts versus um, CMB redshift up here, um, and a few people have pointed that, that out. Uh, and uh, what, we, what Anthony's done in a paper that's come out recently is fix all of these. Uh, and so now we have a nice um, converging um, thing at high redshift. So Anthony's paper actually was really interesting. He went and spent an enormous amount of time going through and looking at all of the historical redshifts in supernova data. Uh, and he found some interesting errors in the tables that we're using, uh, including things like just people had, in the tables, they'd forgotten to add the right ascension and declination. So the peculiar velocities or our heliocentric corrections were all done to the wrong part of the sky. So there are things like this. So this is sort of one of my cautionary tales in this. When you're looking at 
measurements with error bars and stuff, people can stuff up in their, in their small ways and sometimes they're, uh, they don't get noticed. And he's got this amazing three page table, which goes and like assesses uh, basically every redshift that's out there. These, this three page table just looks at all of the redshifts that changed by more than three by 10 to the minus three when he went and looked at corrections, including just typographical like transcription um, errors and stuff like that. But after all of that, you fit cosmology again, and there was no actual impact on the cosmology results that we got for this. Um, and that's because uh, there are as many corrections up as there were down, uh, and any uh, we get, there's a large amount of the sky covered, and so it didn't actually affect things very much. Um, cool. Okay. So I'm basically out of time. So I'll flash up a couple of other things that might be interesting, and people can ask me about if they if they would like. We've looked at redshift errors on baryon acoustic oscillations as well. They should be negligible because they're measured at higher redshift. We've already talked about fork flows. And so I'll just wrap it up with a general comment on error bars. This is a, the classic plot um, from John Hooker, I believe, which is the uh, measured H naught versus time uh, and the error bars that we had. And this is like the plot that people put up when they say, we really need to do blind analyses. And, but you can see that the initial measurement of H naught was 600 and something, plus or minus 50 or so, uh, and or even less than that actually. So that was clearly over optimistic. Um, the more recent measurements since here, hopefully we've gotten a bit better at estimating our error bars, but we should always take error bars with a grain of salt. Um, if you look at NED, for example, all of the redshift, basically everything that's had a multiply measured redshift um, seems to have, everyone seems to overestimate their um, precision. This is, a, this is a plot where you've got the actual scatter in multiple measurements of uh, redshift in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey relative to the actual quoted uncertainty. Uh, and again, there are, when you get to small quoted uncertainties, they're um, basically an order of magnitude higher in the scatter between measurements than the quoted uncertainty. Um, so that's something to be uh, notice about. Um, so I thought I'd quickly, because it's this conference, I just want to flash up two, two, two papers that from different students of mine that you might be interested in and we can talk about in the break. One was one we did with uh, by Sam Cree, spectacular student. We did this with Bill Unruh's group, um, asking whether quantum effects can accelerate the universe. Uh, and another fun one uh, that we did recently and put in the gravity research um, essay competition uh, was Leo Giordani's one asking whether there's an intrinsic spin to galaxies. So to fin finish up uh, my conclusions, tensions are a really, really interesting place to look for new physics. And it would be very exciting if the tensions that we're seeing are an indication of some new physics that we need to, that we need to explain that, and particularly if it tells us how to merge quantum physics and gravity or something like that. But these, my take home message is basically like, we're not able to find a systematic error in our data that can, can explain the tensions at this stage, but there are lots of ways in which measurements can go wrong. So just take it with a grain of salt. Don't get too carried away going, whoa, there's definitely a, 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 an, an error here. Um, and at the moment I'm sitting on the fence as to whether it's a, a systematic error or theoretical re resolution. Um, and I'll stop there, thanks very much. Yes, I'm also getting more convinced to do very complex experiments because you do so many things wrong that you get a right answer <laughs> at the end. So, so that's actually, a, yeah, let's do complicated things. Uh, I see a question there. About five slides ago, you said, oh, and after all this work, after, after all this work, we didn't get any change. Do, are you talking about both the mean value and the, sig the uncertainty or did not, didn't the uncertainty grow? Not really. Um, so the we didn't actually the error bars. Whoops, where was it? Yeah, about here. The error bars didn't change that much. So here you can see the size of the error bars. So the, the gray region in the background, that's the um, oh you can't really see that very well up there. But there's a gray region that the um, that's about the same size as these ones. So this this actual final one here is the gray region, and you can see the error bar size is about the same throughout this. It just shifted the, the main, the central value slightly. Because we're not changing the error bars on the points, we're just shifting their, their right. values generally. Could you put also the historical values of the Hubble constant, not the Hooker one, but the this, this next one on the right, that one. Now, am I supposed to see tension in that plot? No, or is that an really. old plot? No, that, that, that's an, oh, sorry, that's an old plot. I did have the, the new plot um, somewhere. Um, maybe I didn't end up showing it. 
Um, but I've got it <coughs> up here. So I, I get the impression that 20 years ago, there was even more tension. There was a 50 versus 100 debate. And yeah. now we're talking 68 versus 75. And now we're using the word tension much more than we did before. We didn't use the word tension 20 years ago. Yeah. Correct. Um, but there was, so this is some of the, the plots as of at the moment. Um, so this is, this is the one where you can see this step down occurred when the um, plank measurements came in. Uh, and this is the tip of the red giant branch measured, and this is the Cepheid's measurements from H naught. Um, yeah. you, you seem to indicate that if, if Planck did not make the assumption of W equals minus one, that that error bar would then get larger. Is that, am I mistaken? If, yeah, if you add an extra parameter that way, then the error bars do get larger. By a factor of two on that yeah. plot? Or? Uh, I'm not sure what the number would be. Um, but also, once you combine with other data sets, it's very hard to get a W that negative as then sort of the natural Planck alone measurement would make. So that's, I think, what Nikki's going to talk about as well. Like once you, all of those shifts, when you're talking about different models, once you add different constraints in as well, and that's why the thing, there's so many different measurements that all sort of like are coming in from other directions. It's really hard to fix one without breaking another. Okay, so while Nikki's setting up, is there another question? Yeah. Pull up there. It's two. Yeah. Can I, can I? I want to shut this. Oh. <laughs> Whose turn is it? I think you were, you were first, so okay. we'll see if we can I'll answer so, quickly. Uh, about these bulk flow uh, plots that you showed, I'm not, I don't understand them exactly. So this is mm -hmm. probably a naive question, but um, I was wondering, so you, you said that this residual is because you don't understand the, um, the, the, the velocity model well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering, can you turn it around and use this the residual actually to improve your velocity model? Yes, you can. Um, and people definitely use supernovae to try and measure peculiar velocities. Of course, you can't then use that to improve your, to do your cosmology, because that would be circular. But yes, you can do supernovae, you're a great peculiar velocity measurement. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a, uh, uh, a note on uh, the historical graph of the uh, yeah. measurement of the Hubble constant. Uh, actually, in the Euclid consortium, we tease each other with the historical graph of the speed of light, the measurement of the speed of light, which is totally dominated by systematic errors, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, which are much larger than the originally expected uh, random errors, so statistical errors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what, what you show in your, your in your presentation is a lot of theoretical uh, physical aspects of the of the data data interpretation. Mm -hmm. But in this extremely complex measurements like Euclid, uh, we have an extremely compli complicated data pipeline mm -hmm. doing all the calibrations. You mentioned one of the calibrations. Yeah. So also there, you can have all this systematic. Absolutely. And, um, and this is one of the big worries in, in the Euclid consortium. And actually the way we have at least we tried to anticipate on it is by mapping all the data handling, all the data dependencies of all the data products to the input products, which mm -hmm. is kind of the asteroid system, and uh, which is in the end allows you to reprocess and redo things as many times as. Uh, and I think, yeah. you know, we make an estimate of the Euclid data process in uh, you know two times, but in fact, I'm, I can I, we can be sure that we have to do it twenty or twenty five times with all kinds of different uh, parameters in order to. So, uh, the only point I was making. So the, the other takeaway point is it's not only the physics, it is also the data pipeline, which is doing yeah. exactly the same, giving you exactly the same problems. Yeah, I focused on one small, tiny little aspect of the multi-dimensional data pipelines that go into these things. And we test on simulations, but the simulations are, are only as good as we make them. And often the simulations are made with some of the same pipeline that analyzes the simulations. And so there's lots of stuff where things can, things can go wrong and it's really hard to find. So it's, yeah. Cautionary tale, I guess, is the summary of mine. And I'll pass over to Nikki. 